Thank you for joining me on my serialized podcast, Nine Lives. It's a collection of true stories about my life adventures, risk-taking, and near-death experiences. Nine Lives covers a timeline of 40 years, from 1960 up to the year 2000. I invite you to join me in this series of true and incredible accounts of thrilling adventures and more than a few occasions when it all might have ended for me. Welcome to Episode 6 of Nine Lives, a hijacking in Sierra Leone. This event took place in 1967, in Freetown, the capital city of Sierra Leone, where, along with my family, we lived for a couple of years consulting on improvements to the communications infrastructure that included radio and television broadcasting. It was a project of the UK Ministry of Overseas Development. Sierra Leone is currently one of the poorest countries in Africa, having suffered in the 90s from 11 years of civil war. It's a country whose area is about half the size of North Carolina, with a population of about 8.5 million people. It has a very small GDP of around $4 billion annually. However, during the 60s and the time that we were there, the economy was relatively strong, largely due to the export of diamonds. Today, it's largely an agrarian economy, with 80% of the gross domestic product being farm-related. However, Sierra Leone is rich in minerals, and particularly diamonds, and mining still forms a base for the economy. However, during the 60s and 70s, straddled with corruption, and during the time we were there, there were a series of military coups, and we'll talk about that a little later. As most will recognize... During times of political instability, radio and television become extremely important in communicating a message to the wider population. I became unwillingly entangled in this situation. My role was really as an advisor, and not to get entangled with the day-to-day -day operation of the broadcasting organization. However, during each subsequent coup, I was called upon to ensure that the radio and television broadcasting operations were intact and available to whichever officials of the new government needed it. Shortly after arriving in Sierra Leone and taking up my position, the government provided us with a very nice house in an area called Hill Station, which is about three miles from the city centre of Freetown. Our two older children attended a local school run mainly to accommodate children in the diplomatic service and children of officers in the Sierra Leone military. It was close to our home in Hill Station. My daily routine started with breakfast and listening to Sierra Leone radio to catch up on local events and the BBC News from England, after which I would head down to the embassy, check in, then head to the studios of Sierra Leone Radio and Television and the Ministry of Communications to see if help was needed in any area. It soon became very routine, with trips to the beach to enjoy the beautiful beaches of Sierra Leone, and in the evening, to attend various functions at the embassies around town. On one particular morning, my wife woke me up and said, Did you hear the noise last night? I said, No, because I sleep soundly. She said there was a lot of shooting last night. Maybe there was some robbery going on in the neighborhood. I said, Sure, and turned on the radio, which was not the news, but it was playing military music. And I said, I bet there was a coup last night. And yes, there was. After five or ten minutes, an announcer stepped in. He had become a friend of mine. He had been born in Sierra Leone, but educated in England, and had a cultured British accent. He announced that there had been a coup that night, and that no one should come to town, but that everything would be back to normal within a day or two and then announced the new self-appointed president of Sierra Leone, who gave a long speech about why the coup had occurred and how everyone should feel safe now that the previously corrupt government had been displaced. On completing the speech, he handed it back to my friend, who simply said, and now we'll return to our normal broadcasting. He was a DJ, and the first record he put on was The Beatles Help. I saw him later that day, and I said, that was a brave one, and he simply shrugged his shoulders and smiled. The next attempted coup would come soon after. On the 18th of April, 1968, 
Although it might have been a surprise to the general population, it was no surprise to me. Late in the afternoon of April the 17th, following a short visit to the Ministry of Communications, I headed back to the studios. And there in my office on the desk was a brown envelope with my name on it, stamped confidential. Opening it, there were two contents. One a card, and the other a round sticker. The kind that you find in England to prove that your car is registered. And it's usually placed at the bottom of the windshield in one corner. The card contained an embossed image, same as the sticker. Printed on which was the Anti-Corruption Revolutionary Movement. And then a statement that said, Allow Mr. Blank, obviously my name, to pass. The same was repeated on the round sticker. I pocketed the envelope, got in the car, and went home for dinner. Not wishing to alarm anyone, I waited until the kids had gone to bed, and then opened the brown envelope and showed my wife. I said, It looks like we're going to be in trouble again, but why were they sending out an advance notice that there was going to be a coup? There was no indication of when the coup would take place. That would be answered very shortly that evening. Shortly after dinner, around 10 p.m., I answered a knock at the door. Standing there were six army personnel, toting weapons and with a Land Rover sitting outside with the engine running. They were polite enough, but said they'd been sent by the ACRM, the Anti-Corruption Revolutionary Movement. They said the coup had started, and they needed to have the radio and television transmitters on the air immediately as someone had deliberately shut them down. I was unafraid. I knew the Sierra Leoneans very well. Four of the six went with me to each transmitter and to the studios in town. Two remained behind, saying they were there to protect our family. I returned home with my gun-toting colleagues at around 2 a.m. to find everything was fine at home. The kids were in bed, I thanked the two army personnel who'd stayed at the house to guard our family and found out from my wife that she'd entertain them with tea and biscuits. That was the end of a very strange day. We hit the sack and waited to turn on the radio the following morning. It was pretty much a repeat of the broadcast following the previous coup without my DJ and announcer friend hitting the airwaves with the Beatles. It was, in fact, a fairly peaceful turnover of power. I went to the studios the following day, and it was though nothing had ever happened. Nobody talked much about the new government, which was never democratically elected and became a dictatorship, ruling the country for the next 24 years. We never did experience another coup for the rest of the time that we were there in Sierra Leone. The country did, however, experience a wave of crime, particularly robbings and hijackings of expatriate staff who were heading up foreign companies operating in the vicinity of Freetown. And unfortunately, I was not going to escape that. Here's what happened late one night following an event in Freetown. It was late November 1968. The rainy season had ended and people were starting to have parties outdoors. My wife and I were invited to such an event held at the Paramount Hotel, the premier hotel in Freetown. It was again nice to be able to sit out and not be rained out. The dinner lasted several hours, including entertainment. We left around 10.30 in the evening, and we wended our way up the narrow road to Hill Station, which is about 700 feet above Freetown. We had travelled this road regularly, without any incident. We arrived and found everything in order at home. When attending social events, which was part of the job, we hired the services of a young Sierra Leonean lady to stay with the children until we returned. She was great. Her name was Juliet. The kids loved her. Sometimes she would stay overnight, and I'd run her back home in the early morning when I went to the studios. On this evening, she needed to go back to town for an early morning doctor's appointment. 
The time was now about 11 p.m., so we piled in the car to head back down the windy road to Freetown. It was not a totally dark night, as there was a full moon, which certainly made it easier to navigate the narrow road down to Freetown, a journey of about two miles. Along the road were several bridges, the first of which was about a third of a mile from our home. As we approached this first bridge, I noticed that there was a large boulder blocking our path. It seemed to have rolled down the hillside onto the bridge. At least, that was my first conclusion, and I realized that we were not going to make it down to Freetown that night. As the road was too narrow, I couldn't do a turnaround, and realized that I would have to back the car all the way up the third of a mile to get back to Hill Station. And that's when things got really bad. A number of people appeared out of the bushes, wielding machetes. A broad-bladed implement used by many in Africa, in agriculture, and cutting down bushes. This was a life-threatening situation. Juliet started to scream. I immediately threw the car into reverse, and started to back up the hill, not realizing that one of the machete-wielding people was at the back of the car. I felt a thump, so I must have hit him. The others were starting to attack at the front. I continued to accelerate in reverse, not even considering that I might have run over the one at the back. By this time, one of the machete-wielding guys was on the front of the car, and about to smash the windshield. Juliet continued to scream like I'd never heard before. The car was now accelerating up the hill, and the guy on the front slipped off the hood onto the road. By this time, I was gaining distance between me and the attackers. I hit the horn, and I kept my hand on the horn in an attempt to attract attention from people living close to Hill Station, but no one showed up. We were now close to the top of the hill, and an area that I could safely turn around, if I could do that without the hijackers catching up to us. I had in the past practiced fast turnarounds at a police driving academy. I executed the maneuver perfectly. We were now pointing forwards up the hill, with only just a few yards before we reached the top. Juliet continued to scream. Looking back, I saw that the machete-wielding hijackers had given up. Although shaken by this life-threatening event, we arrived home. Juliet calmed down, but was still shaking with fear. My wife met us at the door and realized that something bad had happened. It took a while before we could settle down and tell her the details. It was the first and last time that we'd experienced this type of life-threatening event whilst in Sierra Leone. There continued to be a spate of robberies in the area of Hill Station, but again, we were not impacted by it. Our next-door neighbor certainly was. The house burglars were pretty precise. Our next-door neighbor told us a story about when he woke up and saw a fishing pole coming through the window, attempting to grab a set of false teeth that he kept at the bedside. Another was a friend who ran the local brewery. He'd been there for about 18 months, on secondment from the UK parent. Each time we'd see him, he would report that he'd been burdled once more. He lived in another area close to Freetown. He actually held the record for being burdled, he was burdled every month for 18 months, and the final insult was on the morning that he was about to leave back for the UK. He'd packed, and we had a party for him at the Hill Station Club. When he got home, he'd been burdled again, including the clothes that he'd packed to go home. Regardless of the events that took place over the two years that we were in Sierra Leone, it was a pleasant experience. The Sierra Leonean people were gracious, friendly, and hospitable. Our farewell party aboard the SS Oriel, that sailed between West Africa and Liverpool, continues to be a great dinnertime story. Thank you for joining me on Episode 6 of Nine Lives, an account of a life-threatening event in Sierra Leone. Please join me again for Episode 7 of Nine Lives, when I'll recount another life-threatening event that occurred during our international travels. Music